Welcome back to Psychology Applied to Work. This is Lecture 29, Cultures of Organizations. Last lecture, 28, uh, we talked about structures of organizations. Um, we began Chapter 10. So we talked about organizational hierarchies, networks, and processes. We talked about bureaucracy versus autonomy. We talked about achieving flexibility and autonomy. We talked about teams in organizations. And finally, we talked about formal and informal hierarchies. Today, we'll finish Chapter 10. And this is also about the organization of the organization. But we're going to zero in on culture. That means, we'll say, what is um, organizational culture? And attempt to answer that question. We'll talk about the different dimensions that you can look at organizational culture. Talk about broad types of organizational culture. Talk about this thing called socialization, or how you acclimate, how you socialize to a culture in a new organization. And we'll talk about organizational development, which is, which is related to how you mature and, and steward and change an organizational culture. All right, so what is organizational culture? You've heard me use this term binding narrative. Uh, well, one way to look at organizational culture is the binding narrative of the organization and that encompasses a lot of things. Uh, but if you want to get into the book, um, there you're talking about you know, beliefs and values and expectations. You know, I've talked about in-groups quite a bit and in-groups have norms. So uh, an organizational culture is the shared norms. And those, in, those include the beliefs, the beliefs um, those include the value systems, those include the various stories uh, that are told, um, kind of what the vision, which or the or the goals and meta goals that that the uh, in group is aiming at, the expectations, you know, where do we think we're going, what do we expect of you, and then there's other things, um, sort of the outer trappings that you know you're part of that group, symbols, and then there's habits that tend to tend to happen, and um, and then just the overall environment, and and then other other things to look at in terms of dimensionality of a culture and how it's manifest. But it's really under undergirding uh, or constituting this big in-group that, that is called the organization and the, uh, the behaviors of that. So another way of looking at it, and this, this one bullet here is not on the test, so you can, you can circle that and write not on test, a little extra bonus for those of you who watch the video, uh, this assumptions um, values and artifacts, but it's a, it's a it's sort of a mental model to look at this. So you can think of assumptions as the as the axioms, uh, the the core things that everybody takes for granted and doesn't question. You can you can think of that in the bold up above as the beliefs, uh, and then um, on top of that, with uh, on an inner shell um, around the core, is the value framework, and the values tell you you know what you ought to do, what's important. You know, what's not important, what's good, what's bad. And then you can think of the outer shell as the artifacts or the, or the, the um, displayable norms and, and, you know, signs of tribal allegiance and logos and, and everything else. Uh, it's just a different way of, uh, of looking at um, beliefs, values, and expectations. And the, the other thing to, to look at organizational culture is... Um, it, it is it's, a, it's an expression of in groups, uh, but it's also a way to define yourself against out groups. Uh, but it's also ways of thinking, uh, and you know there's particular ways that it expresses itself in terms of what norms it chooses to enforce and and uh, how they go about enforcing those norms. So if you have a, a formal culture that doesn't want you to wear sandals and hoodies. Um, that that might you know dress code enforcement uh, is a particular culture element, but also to the how much is that expressed? How how important is that? Is that just sort of a unwritten rule that it's kind of okay to violate, but it's not a good idea to help your career, or is it a strict rule? I mean, there's there's a lot of these um, differences across cultures. Another thing about an organizational culture, it tends to be heavily influenced uh, at the founding of the organization, and sometimes by the founder or founders themselves. 
that uh, that founding uh, often sets the story, and the story is often reinforced, and the culture is often built around that. As long as it's you know stable and 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 successful, and the organization continues, it's it's often a source of of um, stating the binding narrative. Um, you know, Steve Jobs is still part of the binding narrative of, of Apple, and uh, you see this uh, uh, in in many organizations that. Um, where the personality or, or the uh, achievements of the founders uh, were um, were generative of the original culture. That, that that's often uh, a thing you'll 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 see even even in a very very old company sometimes. You know, culture has uh, should be no surprise as often I've said things like explicit and imp- implicit, uh, formal and informal. That is a that is a way you can definitely look at culture. There's definitely aspects of an organizational culture that you can define that everybody can explain. And then there's things people kind of know or, um, or but they can't really explain it or you or you you sense it, um, but it isn't part of the art- articulations. So that'd be the implicit, and then formal and informal is is more the, yeah you know is it a hard, is it a hard rule? Is it a is it a thing that's that's not only explicit, but it's 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 explicit as in this is what we do in this organization, or is it more informal in that people talk about it, but it isn't actually part of any any hard structured rule. And um, the other thing is it can be incoherent, which is to say your culture could be different within the organization. You could have countercultural forces at play. You might not have a, a that another way of looking at it is if you have competing binding narratives. You know, if the binding narrative that you're using to tell you who you are, where you're, where you're at, where you should go, and and what what is important, if that doesn't um, um, cohere well uh, across the organization, it won't stick in people's minds, and other um, counter examples will compete. Just like right now in our broader culture, we have a we're kind of in a polarizing moment because we're. We're trying to revivify our joint binding narrative because it is bifurcated. Uh, minimally, it's bifurcated, um, and, and that's been accelerated by social media. But you can have that happen inside a company, where, uh, um, especially if the company's at a crossroads or it has a new CEO that's trying to change it in a new direction, or the market forces are causing, causing uh, it to lose market share, and so it's trying to become somebody new. You'll have. Um, folks within the organization that that are sort of holding to the original binding narrative and not wanting to go to the new binding narrative, and now you have incoherence. Um, it's also if you don't do a good job at understanding your organizational culture and um, keeping it um, keeping it consistent, uh, you'll often have drift, and that drift can be um, as- asymmetric within your organization, which which can be say you can sort of give birth to, to cultural differences or subcultures in your organization. And if you don't, um, if you're not a proper steward of your of your culture, that drives incoherence. And then what you're you have things that cross purposes. Remember when I said it's it's preferable to have a bunch of average performers that are highly aligned, um, uh, and uh, as opposed to a bunch of top performers that actually can't agree on where you want to go. Or in or in this case, you know, top performers where half of them want to go to the left and half of them want to go to the right. So. Uh, Having a consistent, shared binding narrative, a coherent, um, stable, consistent culture uh, is vital to the success of an organization. Now, leadership often has uh, their responsibility to define that culture, or at least that's uh, often explicitly stated of leaders, and leaders say things uh, that are that are deliberate, uh, um, intentional to try to drive culture. But um, a leader can't just say, this is who we are. I mean, it has to ring true. It has to live in people's minds. Uh, it, has to, it has to be coherent with the rest of the organization, or um, it could fall on deaf ears, uh, or only have a minimal effect, you know, or actually have people run uh, counter to it. So it is just the leadership's effort to define and drive the culture is, is, is one element. Now, the culture itself you know, may or may not be compatible with some individuals within the organization, or it might not be compatible with other organizations. You have a company you can buy a new company, or a, a company buys a smaller company. They want to they want to gain that market or that technology or whatever. And sometimes the cultures are just so different and so incompatible that it actually just doesn't work. And sometimes they have to shut it down or or spin it out and sell it. Um, it it's uh, uh, books have been written on these things and how difficult it is to 
to acculturate, you know, or socialize an entire organization when you've purchased it. If you're the, if you're a larger organization, um, and so part of the things about acquisitions is, is take, you need to take into account how, how similar the culture is and how hard it might be to to get the cultures at least close enough to coherence that they're not at cross purposes. Another thing about company cultures, organization cult, or organizational cultures, they can be, you know, so strong and so unique that they kind of have a cult like. Um, quality to them uh, and you know the, it's like this is this is who you know who, who we are we feel this really really strongly and we're definitely not like everybody else and you know we we, we it's it's core to our identity in a much deeper way than in a, than at most other say companies and that can be uh, um, powerful and that actually can be good uh, you know obviously it, it can be bad it can it can it can it can lead to um, a whole bunch of highly aligned effort uh, where everybody jumps off a cliff, so to speak, metaphorically. But cult-like cultures um, ha has been something that uh, some business um, analysts, some business uh, researchers have pointed to as, as a certain, um, certain highly successful companies have such a strong culture that you could take that sort of cult framing to them and look at them and say, yeah, in many ways, these cultures are cult-like. Um, so it isn't, it's a metaphor. It's not meant to be really a, inherently a negative thing. In fact, many people like have strived, we want to be cult-like, but you know, we don't want to be a cult. <laughs> so understand the, 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 the subtlety there. Um, and the other thing about uh, any organizational culture, I mean, it's inevitably nested inside the broader culture of the organization. And that's another thing that um, you need to be careful not to have that at too much cross purposes. Um, if you, if you have a broader culture that is constantly undermining or, or, or in influencing or pulling away from a particular culture that you're trying to maintain within your organization that it, it, it just creates a lot of headwinds um, and, and uh, there's too much the broader cultural influence is extraordinarily pow powerful I mean that's the broader in group the broader binding narrative and people don't really like to have you know competing binding narratives in their own identities you know with their in layer it's it's one thing to go this is sort of how we behave when we're at work and this is how I behave when I'm at so in the softball team and and that's you know that's okay we understand that different contextual situations allow for for you know, different norms or certain norms, you know, norms are themselves contextual or a norm itself is seldom this universal thing. I mean, you'd say, well, what about killing? No, and there's actually times when which um, human beings um, um, have, uh, have a propensity to kill um, and, uh, and justify it within the culture. So a norm is, is, is not really something you can disentangle from the context. So um, the the broader culture, uh, if it, but if it's calling for, um, you know, certain types of norms, uh, it, 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 that when you display them at work, um, it undermines the work culture becomes a problem. Uh, and that, that's often a thing with, um, multinational companies where you've, you've got, um, if you've got a company and it was and, and it's an American company and it was founded in America, um, the the broader culture is so strong that you, you just can't get anything to stick, um, not really, uh, and not stably. If you want to try to have an organizational culture that's at cross purposes with the broader culture, but large multinational companies run into this um, within the within their own company all the time, which is they might have an, several thousand people in America and they've got several thousand people in India and they're working together, um, and you you apply value frameworks and norms from one country to the other depending on which country is like in charge or which groups are in charge of a particular project, um, you can actually run into a lot of cultural issues um, that are work culture and compatibility. But what's driving the work culture and compatibility is the broader culture and the broader culture's influence that the work culture is nested in. Ho hopefully that makes sense. Another thing to think about with uh, organizational cultures, there's always an evolution at play, just like the broader culture is always, you know, evolving and changing for good or for sometimes sometimes for good and sometimes not so good, and and people get dragged along and then people are fighting and that's where we are kind of right now. We're in a, we're in a um, it, maybe it was worse, uh, maybe not in like 1968, which is probably the peak period, the last really peak period where we were. Um, having really really strong culture wars in America um, but even even taking out the current level of polarization um, there's really not a time when there isn't some evolution going on with culture and that's still applied uh, within a work situation 
Um, and so there can also be like a dynamic cultural climate uh, and organizational climate is a term um, um, that uh, is used in IO psychology. It refers to the sort of surface surface effects, surface manifestations. You know, how what what is the the the, the look and feel uh, of the organizational culture right now in this context at this time, um, and uh, that's called organizational climate. Another thing about organizational culture, um, I just talked about it like it's really well defined and understood. Um, it's actually not really that understood. I mean, I, what I've just described is a is a uh, is a gross oversimplification of what's really going on, and it's difficult, uh, you know, to apply any kind of measures to it. I mean, people do surveys, and they ask, you know, they ask people questions, you know, along the lines of how satisfied are you, and th these sorts of things, and then they map it to culture and say our culture's good because people say they like their jobs. Um, well, that's not measuring culture. You know, you're measuring, you're measuring something that you're then attributing cause to your culture, but. When you go and try to really define it in the detail, um, it's actually pretty hard to define. All right, let's talk about um, some dimensions, some ways of looking at culture, and and this isn't a comprehensive list, uh, but this is this is some of the um, the big ones. So um, examples of the dimensions you can look at. Uh, one of them is like how how much autonomy and how much accountability does your culture have? How who, how who makes your decisions? So like a Western NATO um, army uh, will enable the private, the corporal, the sergeant, the, the, the lieutenant um, to actually make many um, uh, battle decisions. Whereas uh, um, um, Eastern, or let's just pick Russian armies are known for, um, you know, the orders flow from up, 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 to up top. Um, and certainly just, you know, the, the, let's take an American versus a, a, a Russian. Uh, soldier, uh, the Russian soldier waits for his, his his or her orders, and the American soldier has orders, but knows that if encountering the enemy, things have changed, that they do have some autonomy. Um, but they also know they'll be held accountable. <laughs> so um, they need to be doing smart things. They need to follow, um, you know, norms, you know, or you know, the, the 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 rules and laws associated with their behavior. They need to do smart things. If they do dumb things, they're they're uh, their autonomy can can be end up end up having uh, being a negative thing for them can be can be punished. Um, so autonomy and accountability often um, come together, and they should. And you get out of balance if you're not. I've talked about that in a previous lecture. But that's one dimension to look at a culture. You know how autonomous is it? How much accountability is there? How well balanced is it? Another thing is like. Um, how much commitment are, uh, is there and how much commitment is expected? How much loyalty is there and, and how normal is a high level of loyalty or a low level of loyalty? Is it really low level and transactional and people come and go and that's no big deal? Um, or is it like, you know, these almost everybody is lifers and they want their kids to work at this organization and that sort of thing. Uh, we've talked about hierarchical distance, you know, and the degree, how formal um, is the culture or informal, you know, do, do you call your boss? sir or ma'am, or do you call them um, by their first name? And we talked about differences between East and West, and certainly Americans are typically the most informal and the shortest hierarchical distance of its least of the major um, business cultures. There's values and axioms, so that's that whole, um, the core and the inner shell. Um, what are your fundamental beliefs? You know, what are your assumptions? What is your value framework? of uh, what's considered uh, proper and what's considered uh, um, poor behavior. And then there's things like origin stories. And that's part of like, a that's like, you know, it's literally a binding narrative in the sense that the, how did we get here? You know, well, you know, our founders decided uh, that there, sure, there was a better way. And that's why the Better Mousetrap Company was formed, formed by Bob and Susan in their garage when their house was infested by mice. And, um, Anyway, so these origin stories are, 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 are common. In fact, you, like if you have a startup, you're supposed to have like this great story of, of uh, why it is that you wanted to find, found this startup with this new technology. Because, you know, you're, um, if, you make it, if you make a compelling origin story, then, you know, people, um, now you've made a nice narrative and people understand your value proposition and all that stuff. So origin stories are common. Um, 
and, and so are BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals. Like we wanted to change the world. We wanted to be, build a mousetrap better than anyone else's mousetrap. And, and those are things that often come within a, a culture too, that, that we have this new big giant goal. Um, so anyway, uh, hopefully the, this is uh, making sense. You also have, you know, heroes and villains and, um, you know, we, and, and this isn't necessarily in a company, you might be a nonprofit and, you know, we're here to fight against the corruption of this or that, uh, the, uh, the despotic regime of so-and-so. And, um, and, you know, we follow the, um, the sacrifice of, the, of this person or that person. So, I mean, th these are, again, these are stories. Um, I mean, I'm not saying they're not correct in their own, in their own way, but I mean, at the end of the day, binding narratives are a kind of shared fiction and it depends on your I'm using an expansive uh, use of the term fiction in the sense that it's a gross dim dimensional reduction of the truth. The truth is in inherently massively more complex. Um, it's not to mean it's a falsehood as much as it is something just ridiculously incomplete, but that's what we humans are stuck with, with our uh, the constraints on our brains, with all of our cognition being essentially a kind of abstracted out um, embodied um, movement in space. But I digress. Another thing is, uh, you know, time, scale, and risk. You know, is this a long, we, we think in the long term, you know, we think in years as an organization, or is this more of a, we think in quarterly profit numbers uh, for Wall Street? Um, you know, what, what's our time, you know, how nimble are we? Are we always under threat and have to move all the time? Or, or, or do we have a, a, a pretty good established uh, market or, or, or function and, and we can talk in terms of years. And that then reflects also on like how, what's the tolerance of risk, what are considered acceptable risks, how much risk aversion is there within the organization. Um, who your stake, overall stakeholders are, who your customers are, um, inevitably become um, part of your culture. Um, what you have for hierarchies and networks in an organization uh, definitely influences the culture. Um, how direct or indirect are you culturally, you know, is, is another way of slicing and dice and culture. So is, um, you know, how open uh, or how closed you are, you know, how, how transparent are you? Um, or, I mean, if, you, if you're like a defense contractor that works on top secret stuff all the time, you know, you're an extraordinarily compartmentalized organization where um, you might meet somebody every day at the cafeteria for lunch. Um, that's your best friend at work, but you can never actually talk about what each other is doing um, because you're working on different uh, classified programs, I mean, just uh, as an example. Uh, and then there's things like ceremonies and traditions. Uh, and, um, and remember that in-groups are often um, um, the binding narrative of an in-group, the definition of the boundaries of an in-group are often uh, built around who we are not. Um, uh, and um, uh, that, that seems to be a more powerful way in which we identify our in-group, um, um, arguably, than sometimes who we are. And so who we are not um, also inevitably uh, can become part of an organizational uh, culture. All right, let's talk about some broad types. Um, you can be a top-down culture. You know, this is like an authoritarian culture or a highly planned and regimented culture, classically Taylorism, scientific management, people are cogs, orders flow down, um, you know, de responsibilities delegated down uh, via authority and orders, and everybody just follows their orders. Um, you could have a merit meritocratic, uh, which is more, it's competitive. You move up by earning it. Um, you know, decision makers, um, you know, set the tone of where we're going to go. Um, if you, you climb the hierarchy through achievement, um, you can be a consensus culture, which is that, you know, we all try to agree, or at least, you know, the people that are uh, in charge of this or responsible for it, the group, you know, tries to agree. You try to get a kind of, not necessarily unanimous, but because it's a consensus culture, um, you, you, you just l allow the group, once it feels like the group's kind of made a decision, even if you don't really want to do that, you feel this powerful norm, norm normative pressure to just go along um, uh, because there, it seems like there's consensus and, and unless it's really uh, a critical thing, you'll just, you'll, you'll just say, okay, I guess we'll do, we'll do that then. Um, so there you tend to have short power distances um, um, because it tends not to be a top-down authority. I mean, whereas a top-down authoritative tends to have high power distances or high hierarchical distance. Um, but consensus cultures, uh, um, because they're egalitarian, 
Um, they tend to be very, very deliberative, which is to say they can argue and talk 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 and, talk and take forever to make a decision. But once they make a decision, because it's consensus and because they, everybody talked it dead to, at, to death, a lot of different iterations of what you might do have been worked through. And it tends to actually make pretty good decisions as long as they didn't waste so much time that it's too late, which can be a real thing if you need to be nimble. Um, and the other advantage is once you finally made a decision, people tend to be highly aligned because everybody goes along with it, because everybody feels like they were part of the decision. You can be uh, a, a culture that's really product focused, you know, that, that uh, we just focus on product excellence and, uh, you know, that's what really matters. I mean, you can be customer focused, um, you know, it can be relationship oriented. Um, and in those kinds of cultures, if you are a customer facing person, um, you know, that, that's its own kind of hierarchical power. You might have no direct reports, but because you're customer facing in a customer focused organization, you, you uh, inevitably have a, um, a, a lot more, um, a lot more, uh, or organizational importance, um, uh, and hopefully this is uh, this is making sense. But you can also have organizational subcultures, which is like a, a higher, an, its, its own hierarchy or a strong network, you know, um, with some elements of unique cultural qualities. Um, and those can be synergistic, which is to say that over here where we do our innovating, where we have a skunk works, you know, everybody's super informal um, and 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 free thinking and non regimented and um, people barely tie their shoes and they come and go at weird hours, but that, but boy, everybody's really outside the box and we come up with great ideas. And that might be okay as long as you compartmentalize it to there and, and when you, and you take those ideas and you have a more regimented, more controlled, um, more consistent organization to like execute that and turn that into a product you might go to market with. Um, in that case, it can be synergistic that you have that cultural difference. So that's more like a specialized culture. Um, or it could be neutral, it's just these people sort of act a different way over here, um, and it's not a big deal because the particular dimensions, they they uh, are different uh, culturally, don't aren't really at cross-purposes with who we are as an organization, but you can also have it where they are at cross-purposes, and so you can have it in antagonistic uh, uh, or detrimental to the overall organizational um, culture. Um, and so along those, one, one manifestation of that antagonistic is an organizational counterculture. And, and that's really where you've got some sort of subculture. You've got some sort of group of people or, or, or maybe one little uh, hierarchy um, that's uh, upset about where things are going. Uh, and uh, uh, often those sorts of um, subcultures that are, in, that are tr trying to run counter to a broader culture is often an attempt to preserve uh, you know, certain cultural elements um, uh, that that are running counter to what's happening now, and often this is because the, the broader culture is shifting, and and people feel like they're, they're we're being dumb, we're making a dumb decision. This new CEO is terrible, and blah 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 blah, um, and we and we've got to preserve this, and and uh, um, and and you can actually get sort of a an in group out group schism. Um, and, and its own little mini culture happening, and, and these things happen in a little in subtle different ways, but um, uh, and and that's part of the give and take of a company trying to figure out if it's if it's making the right decision and going the right direction. But it can also manifest its, it, it itself pretty pathologically, um, in which case you've got a real problem. All right, let's talk about um, coming into an organization um, and this process uh, in IO psychology called socialization. And that's how you're adapting, you're, you're learning, or, or, or you're making an adjustment into something something new. So this is often because you've been hired, and you've come in, um, or you've you've moved you've moved roles, and now you're at a new division within the same company. But it's you know the cultures are are different enough, and sometimes you know you you, you have a, a company that's in multiple states, and you find that you know the the people in North Carolina behave a heck differently than the people in North Dakota. In subtle enough ways, I mean, we're highly fine-tuned to, to, for subtle differences in culture. Um, you know, somebody from um, Bangladesh might be unable to tell the difference between a North Carolina and North Dakota um, regional cultures. You know, but if but if you're inside them and raised in them, you, you you'll pick up on certain differences, and those regional cultures can can then affect the bit the organizational culture, and, and you might go from one to the other, and then have to have a sort of be socialized to it. But certainly, when I mean, you just hire somebody. There's a, so, a socialization process. And if you do it right, um, it leads to good things. Um, people uh, understand what their roles are and what their responsibilities are. You know, people grow their commitment. They, be, they, they start feeling a loyalty to this organization. 
they, they feel um, self-efficacy, which is to say, I kind of, I feel welcome here. I understand what this place is. I understand what I'm supposed to do. I'm feeling this commitment. You know, I want to take action and I feel I can take action. Um, you can uh, reduce the role ambiguity or role conflict. Um, and those are fancy terms, but we'll explain them. So role, role ambiguity is just like, I'm not sure what it is I'm supposed to do here. Or I, I was told what I'm supposed to do, but it doesn't really make that much sense to me. Um, you know, or role conflict, which is, you know, I'm, they, they asked me to do something I'm just not comfortable with. And that, this might be an unethical thing, an ethical thing, which is a big deal. But it also, you know, it could just be, I am just, uh, I, I don't like, um, you know, doing this hard sale. I feel like I'm, um, I'm being someone I'm not. Uh, I'm un, just uncomfortable with this. Uh, and and uh, um, I, I'm not sure if I can keep doing that. So this is like your, the inability to align with, with the culture. And, and, you know, why is that? You know, the, and the answer is, is multifaceted. But uh, often with role conflict, it's, it, you have certain standards. You have the ways of, that you're comfortable acting. And uh, you have a role that um, is, is uh, pushing you to do stuff that you don't want to do. Uh, and if you have too much of that, um, um, you know, there's always, you know, and, and to some extent you could sort of, you think you feel role conflict, but you know, it's just, you didn't quite understand the job or didn't know, you know, what you had, what you were, uh, how much you could stretch, um, or, uh, figure out how to navigate it in a way that wasn't creating you issues. Um, and then everybody's got role ambiguity when they come in until they really understand their job. But, you know, but if you have too much of that, uh, people leave, um, or they certainly aren't happy with their supervisor, you know, that's kind of the first place and it's like, um, um, so-and-so is who I report to and I don't even know what I do or I'm, I'm supposed to do things I'm not comfortable with. I mean, that you're not going to be satisfied with your supervisor and your overall commitment to the organization uh, will suffer. And if you have, uh, so um, obviously if you have poor socialization, you have bad outcomes, and you, but you also can have, you know, um, besides just turnover, um, you know, you can have anxiety and, and certainly uncertainty, which I mean, uh, anytime you have anxiety at some level, you have uncertainty. Frustration. Uh, you can generally be unhappy, dissatisfied. Uh, you start doing less for your job. You get become less motivated. All right. And then there's this thing called person organizational fit, or PO fit. Um, and that's how aligned you are um, or how congruent or how much congruence um, between your values and the organization's values. You know, if you believe that the customer's always right and that you should bend over backwards to help people and you should always give people what, need, what they need and you want to make people happy in the moment and all that, you know, and if that's actually where you work um, and you're in sort of some sort of sales job and you're interfacing with customers and that's your job is, you know, make them happy, you know, change, change, make their day, change their day, do things for them um, and, and, you know, all of the things of the company, uh, um, 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 notwithstanding, you know, that would be an example of where your values and the, and the organization's values fit and you'd have good person organization fit. Um, so to the extent that um, your values and your supervisor, like you're, you've just been hired and your immediate supervisor, you really feel like you guys are on the same wavelength um, uh, uh, on your values framework. You know, you feel good and you get good person organization fit. But if, if you feel it cross purposes uh, uh, with what's important, you know, and what you ought to do and ought not to do. That's, that's values. Um, you can think of the is is versus the oughts again. The is is, is the, sort of the binding narrative about who, uh, who you are, where are you, but the oughts is what, ought, what should you ought to do. And that's also part of a binding narrative. Um, yeah, but your values come out of, kind of, come out of the oughts and the, the, the is is um, are, uh, are, are just, you, you can't explain the values without contextualizing them within the, the structures. Um, so that's getting in the weeds a little bit. But if you, if you don't have good um, um, congruence, okay, if, if, you are, if the employee and supervisor are, are, do not share the same um, values as it relates to acting in the organization, um, you get poor organizational commitment. You know, in, in addition um, to the um, person, or person organization fit coming from um, sort of resonant values or matching values, um, congruence in values between you and your organization and you and your supervisor. Um, it's also been found that you can get good um, PO fit just if you have matching personalities. And this should make, this should make sense. I mean, there are people you just really get along with. Um, uh, and there's people that, you know, you 
can't really say why, but you just always never feel like they understand you or you understand them or you like being around them. Um, but when you've got good, um, um, similar matching personalities, um, especially with your immediate supervisor, that, that tends to improve how you feel about the organization and improves your PO fit. Um, but we got to be a little careful with this term fit um, and not to um, make it too structural uh, uh, because it can get weaponized. It can be used as a sort of a catch-all when for hiring managers. If they don't like somebody because of various reasons that might not be objective um, or they really want to hire somebody else and even though this person is more qualified they really don't want to hire them um, for many many reasons and some of those reasons could be things that you could get you in if it's related to you know uh, protected classes uh, it could you could get your company into a lot of trouble uh, um, and um, um, be on the hook for being sued and, and big fines and, and brand damage, and besides it being a general immoral thing to do. Uh, but there's all sorts of ways that people can be biased for somebody, against somebody, and um, fit is something that uh, um, you, you should, you, uh, human resources will often push against the use of fit as too much of a generalization. So, um, and to say, I'd like to hire this person because their personality is just like mine, um, and that's good PO fit, so isn't that right? Well, that's actually, is that really the thing that, that, that you, sh sh is that good what if, if all companies looked for that? Everybody has monolithic personality. Um, um, it's generally uh, not a good idea. Um, it, it, it's not to be avoided. It's just uh, you don't want to put a lot of weight to that compared to who is objectively, at least as, as objectively as you can be, most qualified um, for the job. All right, let's talk about organizational development. So this is um, the study um, and, uh, and, and the, um, you know, uh, going forth into the company and doing the implementation of changes in the organization that you've planned to do. Um, so you have an organization, people behave a certain way, and you're like, you know, we need to change this a little bit. We need to, people need to be more motivated in this area. They need to think about this more. We need to focus on the customer more. We need to focus on quality more. We need to focus on response time more, um, or whatever it is. Um, and if uh, people who have responsibility for the organization and leadership is like, hey, we, we need to focus on the customer more. Well, how do you, do you go about doing that in a, in a smart way, in an intentional and effective way? And that's where organizational development comes in. And there's lots of different techniques. Um, there's, you know, sensitivity training. We're going to do this training and we're going to give everybody an understanding of what it's like to have crappy customer service. And so they can have that perspective uh, and they're sensitized to that. And hopefully now when you're making um, their burrito, you're doing it with, with care and love um, and not disregard for their humanity, um, which I'm not joking. That's a, you ever go and get your, uh, go through a line at a fast casual place and you just know this person wants to do a, go, wants to do a good job. And, and this person's like, this isn't me and I don't care. Um, and, you know, I think I've had this conversation with this with, in a previous lecture, but um um, you know, there's a big difference in how you feel as a customer. And that can also take the form of role playing. And again, this is like perspective shifting. Uh, and so people can properly contextualize ideas and, and maybe, and maybe change their perspective a little bit. Um, you can have groups discuss this, basically discuss things, um, so that people understand that, Hey, we want to behave a different way. We've got to focus on quality and here's why it's costing us money. Uh, it's hurting our brand. Um, this new competitor came in and, and people are saying that this stuff never breaks. Um, let's talk about this. Let's talk about what we'd have to do. Um, let's talk about the importance of it. Um, or you can do things um, to try to uh, um, change um, um, elements of the job that might just sort of, because these new elements of the job are there, you're, you're incentivizing good stuff and disincentivizing stuff you don't want to do. I mean, you do surveys, find out how people really feel. Um, Find out where the pain points are that are that, are, that you might want to invest in training, um, or do some do some outreach. And then there's people um, uh, that are you know, sometimes called change agents, and they are organizational development facilitators. And I mean, they work to do things like let's let's do a team building exercise. You know, let's improve the confidence and the cohesion of these teams. As with, let's um, see what we can do to make people more effective. So there are professionals sometimes within organizations and sometimes often, you know, third parties that come in and, and charge a fee to, you know, to help facilitate um, organizational development activities. And so that should, it should make sense to you then when you're doing socialization, 
um, uh, that you need to manage that intentionally. So in this case, when you're doing organizational development, socialization is kind of something that happens to everybody because now this is an attempt to actually change the culture for everybody. So everybody's kind of new to that element of the culture. So everybody has to hopefully be socialized uh, and adapt to that new cultural element. And if you don't do that well, if you don't manage that intentionally, then people just don't. And then you spend a bunch of time and effort to try to change the organization and you only change part of it. And now you have incoherence and possibly things running across purposes. And you should remember that anytime you're, you're trying to institute some change, you know, that, that can often be a source of stress. Um, you know, you're moving people's cheese, so to speak. Um, and a lot of times that's associated with uh, anxiety and fear. And you, you want to involve leaders, you want to involve the managers and the employees, everybody you want to bring them in as participants in the plans. Um, so people, uh, generally you want transparency in these sorts of things uh, to the extent that it's possible. Um, see if you can make it a thing everybody feels like they bought into and had a chance to talk about and, and, and participated in the sort of coll the collective decision that this is how, what we need to do differently. Um, if you, the more you do that, t typically you can reduce the negative outcomes, um, as opposed to like just saying, Hey, from now on, these are the rules and now on, we're going to focus on this. And people are like, I don't know, um, why we're doing that. And sometimes they'll, they'll end up fighting you, um, and, and, or just passively by not ad adopting it or counterculturally trying to undermine you. All right. So that is our lecture kind of, uh, re reasonably short, finished up, uh, chapter 10. So we talked about cultures. So we talked about what is an organizational culture. Uh, we outlined a number of dimensions um, uh, uh, to look at uh, organizational culture. We talked about broad sort of typing of, of uh, organizational culture. We talked about the importance of socialization. And we talked about organizational development. All right, I am um, going to deviate from the original syllabus because I was able to um, uh, find somebody uh, um, in, out in the real world that uh, every day um, uh, this person applies IO psychology uh, in, uh, in her role as a human resources professional. Um, so um, the bonus lecture associated with this is actually going to be uh, watching uh, her video, uh, uh, sort of podcasty interview of her, um, and um, uh, doing the same kind of write-up uh, for that as you've done for the other bonus lectures. And that should be good. All right, we'll see you for that lecture.